the British International Motor Show. On the surface, all looks rosy. But for Austin Rover, the future success of the company is at stake. These visitors are not just here out of curiosity. They represent the largest market for cars in Britain, company cars. That's all. And your replacement policy is what? Over half the cars sold in Britain are bought by companies who keep fleets of cars for their representatives to drive. If Austin Rover are to prosper, it's this fleet market they must capture. Fleet cars in Britain take half of all cars sold. We've been absent from that sector for about eight years now. We're now fully competitive with the Montego, with the new compact Rover, and with the Maestro. In fact, so much so that we're going to turn our resources to exports, where our growth has to come to make our company totally profitable. But there's fierce competition for the fleet car market. It comes from two giant American corporations who both manufacture cars in Britain. Ford, who makes Sierra, and General Motors, who make the Vauxhall Cavalier. When a car has been as successful as the Vauxhall Cavalier, any changes are certain to attract attention. Suddenly, General Motors, which is uh, the biggest car company in the world, based in the States, decided it wanted to get its act together in Europe. And they wanted to take on Ford. And so they chose the UK, Britain, as the, as the, the main battleground. And in the last three or four years, those two companies have been really scrapping. Britain is the battleground for a shootout between these two giant companies, Ford with the Sierra and General Motors with their Vauxhall Cavalier. It's into this fight that the much smaller company, Austin Rover, have launched their new car, the Montego. And there's a new challenge to all three of them. The Japanese are about to open a new car factory, and it's in Britain. Fewer than one car in five on Britain's roads is made by Austin Rover. To succeed, they must sell more cars. The problems for Austin Rover go back more than 20 years. In 1959, the Mini was hailed as an engineering breakthrough, but financially, it was less successful. It was sold too cheaply. The company made no profit out of the Mini for the first nine years. That meant that there was no money to spend on researching and developing new models. Car factories became old-fashioned, productivity was low, and the wage bill too high for the company to make money. The British Motor Corporation, as Austin Rover was then called, was facing ruin. Their cars had a poor reputation for quality. They had too many different models aimed at the same market. In the 1960s, the government only allowed car companies to open new factories in areas of high unemployment. The result was too many factories scattered too widely across the country. And industrial relations were becoming a problem too. As sales of British cars fell, foreign imports rose. German and French cars became popular. They had an image of being fun to drive. They were often more reliable than British cars and better value for money. British Leyland, as they were by then known, went deeper and deeper into the red. By the late 1970s, many people thought that British Leyland had come to the end of the road. If they were allowed to go out of business, there would be no British-owned company mass-producing cars. But the government couldn't afford to stand back and let the British car industry die. They appointed a new chairman of British Leyland, Michael Edwards. Within four years, he closed 21 of the company's 35 plants and halved the workforce. If any manager, if any shop steward or any employee doesn't like the heat of the kitchen, now is a good time to get out. Following the appointment of Michael Edwards, a brand new range of cars has been produced, starting in 1980 with the Metro. And to go with the new image, a new name, Austin Rover. Most of Austin Rover's manufacturing is now centred at Cowley, near Oxford. Cowley is where some of the very first cars were made in 1913, 
and it's at Cowley now that a technological revolution is taking place. These robots are capable of building several different models on the same production line. Here they're welding the side of a maestro. But next on the production line is not a maestro, but a Montego saloon. The robots are programmed to recognize the different designs and to weld each one according to different programs. New production techniques like this can respond quickly and efficiently to changes in demand. Austin Rover call this flexible manufacturing. They can vary the numbers of each type of car made on the line, more estate cars than saloons, or more Montegos than Maestros. But the line itself is always working at full capacity, and that's good for business. It's one way of staying ahead of your rivals. Robots work quickly and hardly ever make mistakes. But people are still needed to assemble parts of the car's body. But even with one of the most efficient car plants in Europe, there's still one big problem facing Austin Rover. Selling enough cars, if you are a company like Austin Rover producing 400,000 cars a year, you are still way behind when you're talking about people like Fiat and Volkswagen and, and Ford and General Motors who are getting a million and a half cars a year out of their plants. In the past, the government has given Austin Rover billions of pounds. They are unlikely to continue to do so. It's the profits from cars such as the Montego that must pay the immense costs of researching and developing future models. The cost of developing a new car can be lowered by using computer-aided engineering. Computers speed up the design process. Years of work can be done in weeks. Car parts can be tested by the computer without the need to build many expensive prototypes. Changes can be made without having to redraw plans. And the same computers can control the machines that build the cars. These are some of the most advanced robots in the world. A car is made up of over 15,000 parts, and most still have to be put in by hand. Very few of these parts, or components, are made by Austin Rover themselves. The glass and rubber seals for this window are made by other companies. So is the winding mechanism for raising and lowering the window. Near the big car factories, hundreds of smaller companies make components for the motor industry. The livelihood of many people in the West Midlands depends upon these companies. Wilmot Breeden make many different components, mainly for Austin Rover. This machine is cutting pieces of metal for the Montego's window winder. But the British car industry is no longer big enough to keep all the traditional component suppliers in business. Many factories have closed. Wilmot Breeden are among the survivors. They've recently introduced modern technology into their factory. They are now part of a large American corporation, Rockwell International. Jobs in the components industry have halved in the past three years. If Austin Rover closed, the effect on the West Midlands would be devastating. 
Governments want to keep car companies alive. If they allowed the company to go out of business, it would cost, in the short term, much more, because it's not just a, a car plant that closes, it's the component suppliers that suffer. That's why, in a way, the government put money into Austin Rover. It was not just for Austin Rover's sake, it was to preserve the components industry in Britain, which in the past has always been a very big money spinner for Britain. There's a sweetness that is England, and it's tugging at my heart, where a Devon road is winding by the waters of the dark. By the 1930s, Britain was the second largest car maker in the world. While other industries declined, car making flourished. The message of this Ford advertisement was clear. What was good for Ford was good for Britain. And because we make a motor for a Surrey man to drive, there are cotton hands in Rochdale who will keep their hopes alive. And because we make a tractor for a farmer down in Kent, there are jobs up there in Durham, and there's money to be spent. There are hopes to be replenished. There are dreams to be restored. There are lives to reach fulfillment through the making of your form. Today, 40% of all Fords sold in Britain are made in other European countries. This arrangement suits the company very well. It means that the cost of developing new cars can be shared amongst many Ford companies in different countries. Ford cars are designed not just for a British, but for a European market. By looking closely at the cars in the sale room, it's possible to find out where they were made. These two Sierras look alike. But this one was made in the United Kingdom, while workers in West Germany built this one. Other Ford cars are made in Spain, Belgium, and the Republic of Ireland. But with falling demand for cars, Ford's large number of factories scattered across Europe is now causing them problems. And there have recently been rumors that Ford may close a factory. One of the factories said to be at risk is at Halewood in Britain, but this would be an unpopular move. If Ford closed any plant in Britain, it would be devastating for their market share because uh, it would be front page news everywhere. They would be, uh, trade unionists would be uh, very upset. They would be, they'd ban their, their, the car imports from Ford. They'd go through a very, very nasty phase. And if they decided to close a British plant, well, they'd have to accept a big drop in their market share as a result. Ford's chief rival, General Motors, might then take the lead. This is their factory at Luton, where the Vauxhall Cavalier is made. Very few of the component parts of the Cavalier are made in Britain. Most are brought into the factory from overseas. The Cavalier is assembled from components made in many different countries. This consignment of wheels has come from West Germany. Gearboxes are made in Japan or in America. They're fitted to engines that have been shipped from Australia. At Luton, all these parts are brought together and assembled on the production line. Very few of the components are British. The steel for the body is British, but it's sent to West Germany to be pressed into shape. Different versions of the Cavalier are made all over the world. General Motors can make savings by putting factories in developing nations. By making components and cars by the million, the cost of each car can be kept down. The Vauxhall Cavalier was designed by another General Motors company, Opel, who are based in West Germany. General Motors hope that what is called their world car will be a world beater. 
Opel has designed and developed cars, and they come over to Britain uh, in most, mostly in kits, and Vauxhall puts them together, adds some local components, and you've got a Vauxhall car at the end of it. Recently, General Motors opened a new factory at Saragossa in Spain. It's said to be the most modern car factory in Europe. It'll provide work for 10,000 people and produce a quarter of a million Vauxhall Novas a year. Many hoped the factory would have been built in Britain and accused General Motors of going where labor was cheap. The reason Spain has got new car plants, like General Motors put in a car plant which is producing the Vauxhall Nova into Spain, Ford put its latest plant to make the Fiesta into Spain, was really to do with the market. Those are small cars, and the further south you go into Europe, the poorer people tend to become, and the smaller the cars they can afford. That's basically it. So they put the plant near the big market. And in Britain, too, a major car manufacturer is putting its plant near the market. But it's not a British manufacturer. In 1984, the Japanese company Nissan started work on a new factory in a blaze of publicity. It's near Washington Newtown in the northeast of England. When the factory is built, Nissan will assemble here up to 100,000 cars a year. They'll be sold in Britain and also exported to Europe from a nearby deep water port. Nissan's cars will be still more competition for Austin Rover. Is it wise to let our rivals compete so directly? The uh, government says that Nissan can uh, contribute a lot to the British motor industry, wants components and it has technology that it can introduce and others can learn from. Uh, on the other hand, the market can only take so many cars and Nissan is going to become a British manufacturer. I think it's going to put more pressure on Austin Rover. Austin Rover's answer is, if you can't beat them, join them. For several years, they've been making cars jointly with Honda, another Japanese company. Together, they built the Rover 200 series. There are advantages for both companies. Costs of research and engineering skills are shared, and both firms can sell more cars in each other's country. Soon, a new luxury car, known at the moment as the Rover XX, will be launched by Austin Rover and Honda completing the Austin Rover range. With it, Austin Rover hoped to gain a foothold in the lucrative American market. The next year will be critical for Austin Rover. The Metro started them on the road to recovery, but unless the Maestro and the Montego succeed, the company faces great problems. Austin Rover are already thinking about their next generation of cars. To pay for them, the present generation must make a profit. So far this year, sales have been less than Austin Rover hoped for. They must sell more cars at home and abroad. It remains to be seen whether they will attract the all-important fleet car market. And the car industry is fiercely competitive. Austin Rover's rivals will not give up.